Uh, good evening, councillors, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's meeting of corporate scrutiny of the 4th of October 2023. Uh, the first item on our agenda is apologies for absence. Uh, before I take any apologies, uh, can I just remind uh, members that this meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube. Thank you. Uh, I think we're all, I think we've got a full house this evening, but I don't think we've got any apologies. No? Excellent. Second item is the minutes of our previous meeting. Uh, we look for um, to approve the minutes of the two previous meetings held on the 27th of July and the 8th of August. I'm looking for a mover and seconder on block unless anybody has any issues with those minutes. Moved by Councillor Price, seconded by Councillor Doyle. Before I go to the vote, anything to raise? All those in favour? Those are carried, thank you. Uh, item three, are there any declarations of interest? Excellent. Uh, update from the chair. I have no updates at this time. However, if I can quickly discuss with colleagues at the end, I have circulated a couple of emails about getting us all together for a working group and the emails have bounced around and people have had trouble uh, aligning dates. So if we can all just open our diaries at the end of the meeting and just nail down a date, I'd be incredibly grateful. Uh, item five, responses to reports of the Corporate Scrutiny Committee. We've got none at present, which take us to item six. Consideration of matters referred to the Corporate Scrutiny Committee from Cabinet or Council. We currently have none. I'll therefore take us to item seven, which is the medium term financial strategy. Uh, can I welcome the Interim uh, Executive Director of Resources, Joe Goodfellow, and the portfolio holder. I thought we've got a TJ actually. Uh, in that case, I'll welcome the Leader of the Council, who will be helping us on that matter, Councillor Paul Turner. Uh, if we can have a brief introduction of where currently the financial, where financial council is. I know a report has been circulated, but if we could have a brief update from either the leader or the officer, I would be incredibly grateful to open the item for committee. Yes, uh, TJ uh, has got other things on, and it being so I was uh, summoned, I'll uh, <laughs> yeah, take his place. Uh, and I'd now like to uh, open the, uh, the room up for, for Joe to discuss. Thank you. Um, so this report was to provide further information with regard to the um, medium term financial strategy forecasts. Um, at its meeting on the 8th of August, Corporate Scrutiny Committee received the quarter one corporate performance report, which included the updated MTFS forecasts as at the 30th of June. So updates to the MTFS are considered by CMT, Corporate Scrutiny and Cabinet on a quarterly basis based on the financial information contained within the MTFS, which is approved by Council in February each year. As a result of the updated forecast at quarter one, the projections now identify general fund balances of 3.7 million by 2025-26, a shortfall of 0.7 million by 26-27, a shortfall of 4.8 million by 27-28, and then a shortfall of 9.5 million in 28-29. As members will be aware, savings are usually considered annually as part of the budget process. This update is the first step in reviewing the forecast during July as part of the Q1 financial health check report. Um, and this includes any further indications from government and those from the local government finance settlement. This informs the scale of cost reductions needed as part of the budget process. This has just commenced and managers have again been asked to identify further areas for potential savings and growth opportunities for consideration by members as part of the budget process. With the ongoing uncertainty around the fair funding review and business rates reset, it makes it difficult to plan in the longer term, which is what we have experienced for the past 10 years as this review has been deferred numerous times and now is a question of if rather than when it could happen. A further consideration is the potential scale and scope of any government funding reductions. There therefore needs to be a balance between hoping for the best and planning for the worst, which could co include consideration of cost efficiencies, increased income, but ultimately service reductions. Therefore, it is suggested that the focus is on achieving a balanced three-year MTFS pending further clarification regarding planned reforms to local government finance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Anything to add, Paul? Uh, no.
Okay, uh, so obviously uh, there's our update. Uh, currently, obviously as work commences towards presenting budget to council next February, we're currently potentially, I think it's a central case, uh, around nine million adrift over five years in the general fund. Don't think we're massively adrift in the HRA every time we look at the adjustments. Obviously, uh, we are corporate scrutiny. It's our job to look at these things. Uh, there are other processes in the budget, but obviously it was right to fetch here. So I'll open the floor to any questions or comments. Councillor Bain. Just a question, really. I haven't been through this process at this council before, and all forecasts are based on assumptions. And I just wondered where the assumptions actually come from and what they look like. Are they based on what's happened previously, on benchmarking with other councils? How are these assumptions uh, reached in the end? Well, first of all, we build on the, the base budget as was approved um, in the February of the year. We'll then look at any known changes. Um, for example, there was a planned increase in national insurance contributions, which then got reversed out recently. So we know that we're going to have a potential saving there. We'll look at the latest outturn projections and build those in. And any other changes that, that we know are coming along. And we'll make an assumption about pay awards, for instance. It's, it's that kind of thing. I would find a session clarifying what the assumptions are. I would find that quite useful in, in reaching conclusions about the overall budget. It, would that be possible, just online, just to tell me where they come from or what they look like? Um, there is further detail in the report in terms of the central case and, and best case. Um, we can also set out the inflation rates and things that we use as well. I would find that helpful um, because at the moment it's quite difficult for me to judge whether the position is good, bad or indifferent and I think I need to understand the assumptions to reach that conclusion unless you have a view on whether it's good, bad or indifferent at the moment. Well, we have, as you say, we have a, a central case and then a, a best case and a worst case. Um, the central case is probably the more reasonable one um, but you know, it, it is early stages. Um, the, there'll be a process of uh, policy changes that we need to go through, which are considered by members, um, and then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll make it. Obviously, members will make the decisions then as to what is included and, and what isn't. Any further questions or comments? Okay, just a well, probably a long comment from me. I think Andrew, the Chief Executive, is probably aware of my feelings on this. We've been dancing with this budget since probably 2010 when the austerity began. And we've always seemed to, in my opinion, and I've been central to this and I accept that, we've always seemed to accept we've just got to deal with now. And we've been doing that so long now, I don't think we've ever long-term planned. We haven't long-term planned for so long. I don't think we know how to anymore, and that's not a judgment of any officer or any councillor. I'll give you this as a brief story. 2010, we'd already had announced uh, by the end of the very last Labour government that we expected because of the ceiling to actually see our budget decrease, the revenue support grant. In came the new Conservative and Liberal coalition, which then started to say public spending needed to reduce. And I'll be the first to say there was massive overspend in the public sector in 2010. I'd now argue it's gone too far, but that's for another day. Obviously, then I watched you know, our revenue support grant be slashed year on year on year on year with the saving graces the government then offered were, you know, basically new homes bonus. So all of a sudden for the houses that Tamworth was building, we were getting new homes bonus, which was basically the equivalent of six years council tax for every new home you built came into Tamworth for a council. That propped up our budgets for a while. Then they started cutting that back. Then along came 100% business rate retention, which we started budgeting for. And then all of a sudden it arrived at 75%, which then killed us. I'll tell this chamber the truth. We had on paper in 2017 a seven to eight year budget that balanced. Then the government actually announced the figures and it no longer balanced. And we always seem to be waiting for the government to do the next thing, the next thing. And we don't long term plan as a council anymore because we're just waiting for the government to do the next thing. And as I came towards the end of my leadership of this council, I was getting really frustrated with that, that we don't no longer think, how do we secure the future of this town, this, this council, without waiting for the next government review? And that really concerns me. And then along came what's known as fairer funding review. For those that might not know what it is, it's basically this. 
In 2013, the government said, if you, pro if you promote your economy and you grow your economy, you get the benefit. This is going to blow your mind, some of you, right? This is how business rates work for this council. For the sake of argument, we collect £30 million a year in business rates. The government says Tamworth Borough Council keeps 40%, the fire service get 9%, the county council, sorry, the county council got nine percent. The fire service got one percent. The government get the other fifty percent. Then they hit you with what's called top up and tariff. And what it is, there are places in this country that cannot raise business rates, no matter how they try. The centre of Wales, Cumbria, because businesses are not going to locate in these remote places, so they can't raise their own business rates. So the government then offers you a calculation that says, of your forty percent, Tamworth, we actually think you only need to keep eight percent to run your council. So when they say we keep forty percent, we actually only keep about eight percent and the other 32% was off, principally, believe it or not, to Birmingham City Council, right? But what they said was, if we set your base rate at 30% for the business rates you collect, for everything you collect over that, you can actually genuinely keep the 40%, which is what's meant to this council for the last 10 years, somewhere between 1.8 and 2 million pound a year, if you're right on that figure, Joe, wouldn't I? And that's what we kept for growing Tamworth economy over that time, 1.8 to 2 million pound a year. Under fairer funding formula, what the government is proposing is, because council, some councils have a serious social care need, and you know, a lot of our population is ageing and not unfortunately, well, fortunately not passing away as quickly as they used to do and they're living a lot longer, there is a massive demand on councils with a social care need. But Tamworth Borough Council doesn't deal with social care, Staffordshire County Council does. So what fairer funding formula is proposing to do is take that growth from us that this council drove and hand it over to another council. As I've said for a long time, that is not fair. As much as you call it fair or funny problem, it's not fair. Because this council drove a lot of that growth in that period. So when that kicks in, that's the reason we principally have a £9 million hole in five years. Because that may happen next year, it may not. It's been delayed for a few years. But it's again us waiting, and it's my concern, it's us waiting again for the government to tell us how, sorry to say, it's screwed we are. Is it time we start taking a little bit more of our destiny into our own hands as a council and start long-term planning and if they don't do it, and we're better off, we can then look to reinvest that in public services in town. Or is it time, actually, to say, let's just get a grip of this now, and I'll stick my hands up and say, for 10 years I watched this and waited for the next government thing, waited for it, and I got really frustrated after eight or nine years. But my time was coming to an end. But we seem to be caught in that trap now, and that concerns me massively going forward. And that's just some comments to me, and I welcome some comments back, certainly. don't disagree with what you've said. Um, the risk is that we start looking at potentially making co cuts and cost savings and then <coughs> we didn't have needed to because the government comes back with a, a better settlement than we, we might have been expecting. Do, do we genuinely believe in the situation we're in economically at the minute as a nation we're going to get more money out of the government? I don't think we are, but thank you. Hey, uh, Chair, I, mean, I, I won't, might make a, a political comment, but I think the, the, the <laughs> fundamental problem we've had is exactly what you've said. We have this, this period of uncertainty that was initially only going to be a few years. We're now in the 10th or 12th year of uncertainty. The, the major issue for us is, is sort of the business rates retention, which um, I think is going to be, we're a few years away from whatever the outcome there. I, I don't know any more, you know, an, an, anything definite. But that's one of our pivotal areas that we would have to rely on. It's, it's fundamental income into the council. And, and there's only so many things we can do so differently to, to try and mitigate against that. Um, so I think that's, say, the, the, you know, we, we try and plan as long term as we can. But after three years, we're actually, it's quite difficult because we're, we're constrained by, uh, by what we know. And you're quite right, our assumptions are based on our best knowledge at the point in time. Uh, it's unlikely our assumptions will be way out. Um, you know, historically, that's been proved to be, to, to be right because of the way we sort of refine the detail. But until or unless we have certainty on the big ticket items, that's really, um, that's, that's almost a building block. If we know we're going to lose our business rate growth in three years' time, great, because that's it, line in the budget, end and we then plan from there going forward. So that's the sort of challenges that we're, it's, it's a bit like stapling an elastic band. We can fix the one end, but we're not quite sure where we can 
fix the other end yet. But I think that as time goes, I think that is getting more certain. Um, because you're quite right, I don't think it will continue as an open-ended, um, sort of, I won't say open-ended check, because it, it isn't, but an open-ended <coughs> arrangement um, where we're at at the moment. Further questions or comments? Uh, Council Bain. Yeah, I will, uh, I will make one. Um, I mean, I like the idea of a long-term plan, um, but there's an old saying that a plan works perfectly right up to the point you put it into action. And that's when it starts falling apart. So I think there's, a, there's an issue there in this culture of uncertainty about trying to say that we've got a long-term plan that's going to be realistic, although I do sympathise entirely. I do have to say that 32% to Birmingham doesn't sound the safest investment in the world at the moment, does it? Um, so is there a way in which we can keep more of that for ourselves? Is there a way of making a case to keep some of that for ourselves? Is, is that doable? I, I don't know. I haven't been involved in this before. I think you're referring to the business rates, Paul, that yeah. we were in. So we're currently well, in... We're referring to top up and tariff. Well, yeah, there's top up and tariff. It is very complicated. Um, we're currently in a pool with um, the rest of Staffordshire and, and Stoke-on-Trent. That's the pool that we're in. Um, so I think those arrangements are governed by um, how the government set it up and what we're allowed to do within the pool. Um, so I'm not sure there's any scope for amending those percentages. I mean, it's, it's really difficult. It's isn't the same it? tantrum I've had for 10 years. Yeah, it's really difficult, isn't it? Is there anything we can put in place which introduces more certainty? Is there anything we can do? Because it just feels like we're just waiting on something to happen all the time. Is there anything we can do? I think, from, from my perspective, and I think um, Councillor Cook will perhaps bear me out with this, um, we have lobbied in the past. Um, and you know we we will still lobby as best we can. Um, you know that's that is really all we can do in, in this situation. Uh, I mean we are we are in a good place. You know although it may seem some some uncertainties, but from looking around the region, we are still in a in a you know in a very strong position. Um, but it would be nice to have a lot more certainty. Yes, but so so that is down to you know to to our elected members to uh, to fight our cause in every every possible arena that they uh, they can do and I think we need to do that and I'm not looking at anybody in particular to help us to do that I do think we need to do that lobbying as as hard as possible because people deserve certainty not least of all the staff who work here I actually agree with you Councillor Bain that fundamentally uh, 100% uh, we, we need to drive this we, we, not a political comment, but we do find ourselves in a council of no overall control. And I think a cross-party drive to consult with government right now, I think, would be absolutely the right thing if you know the three political entities plus the two independents could come together, put something together to challenge government right now and say, well, look, we know there's a general election next year and things may change one way or the other. To me, no matter what colour of the party, it seems it's a new government every year anyway, in my opinion. Um, but I would... I'd certainly support a recommendation that cross party we look at this budget, you know, and cross party we certainly, you know, put together a letter to government saying, you know, look, you've watched Birmingham, we've got this go, these are our issues. What long term certainty can you now start offering up? I don't if if I moved that recommendation, would you support me? Uh, yes, I would support that. Okay. Paul, did you want to jump in before we go forward? Yeah, I would. Um yeah, thanks, Danny. And I think everybody around this room uh, understands that running an organisation, you have revenue and expenditure. It's quite straightforward, profit and loss. And um, when you cannot forecast the revenue more than about a year, it's very difficult. We do a fantastic job, the team has done, to get the three-year balance. In fact, you know, we're in surplus at the moment. Trying to predict and go through your crystal ball 10 years down the line, with there's too many variables. And my concern, I have no problem in helping and supporting and getting our heads together, but I do wonder how much we'll focus on that and achieve actually not, nothing because the external circumstances are bigger than all of us. 
I agree with Tamworth. We are looking at revenue, expenditure, income, the whole shebang. And there is some really detailed scenario planning, as Joe and uh, Mr. Barrett has said. You know, they do the worst case scenario, they do middle case, they do the best case scenario planning for, for the financials. We are also, you know, in, in a really strange period since COVID, where the cost of raw materials, labour, taxes have really increased. I mean, interest rates at six, seven, eight percent, which is the highest they've been for 10 years. So if we'd have been stepped back a year ago and done your strategic plan thinking, would we have said, yeah, they're going to go from zero or 0.5% to six? You'd have probably sat around the table and said, don't be silly. So I, I agree, we, you know, all the brains that we can put around this table to sort of do the best, happy days. But it is a, it's like walking on quicksand. Uh, Birmingham, you know, they, they just showed how difficult it is to balance their books. Thanks, Chair. I'd love to second that motion. Uh, with my time on Cabinet, uh, working with Danny, I've witnessed some of the things that central government have tried to do to us. And um, if we can put any pressure on them, we've tried in the past. We've tried a lot of things in the past to put pressure on them. But I'm only, I'm only too willing to second it. All right. OK. In the hope of this not getting political, but can I branch it out a little bit? Here's my recommendation. Uh, Cross-party, we'll send, we'll send his recommendation to Cabinet to follow a process, obviously, but cross-party, we write to government, laying out our issues and asking for what more longer-term certainty we gain. We don't end up down the line of Birmingham, Woke and Thurrick, I think, are the big ones at the minute. Uh, but also, the three scrutiny chairs are invited onto the uh, budget-setting group to um, help put more minds together, given that, the fact, we're no overall control council. Uh, that would be my recommendations I'd like to send to Cabinet. I'd look for a seconder for those recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Doyle. And then I'll open the floor to question those recommendations, if that's all right. I'm happy with that. I think from the office perspective. Okay, all those in favour? Those are carried, thank you very much. Can we send those to the next Can cabinet meeting? Uh, I'll take us to item eight. Uh, it's entitled Update on Leaseholders. Uh, to give committee, obviously, I did email everybody last Friday about roughly what this is. Um, as, as we all know, uh, this committee sent some recommendations to Cabinet on the 23rd of February in regards to the leaseholder roofs. Uh, there were seven recommendations, as I recall. However, Cabinet did approve six of them. And uh, we identified on the 20th of June a follow-up meeting of this uh, committee that none of them had really been actioned. Hence, we took the matter to full council, which I believe was the 21st of August, where we actually got some action and some review around leaseholders. The reason for this item is, and it's called under the Constitution a hold to account item, is to ask our officers and our cabinet member, who I accept wasn't responsible in the 23rd of February, to actually hold to account. How did we get to a point where those recommendations even moved so slow or were just being completely ignored? And it's, a, it's called a hold to account event because we need to understand how to learn from it and how to ensure this council again doesn't... I'm going to use the term circumnavigate its democracy, but I'm not saying that's what happened. It's just what came to my head. So, yeah, it's basically an opportunity to look at it and learn as a council from it that how do we ensure that situation doesn't happen again where the poor leaseholders were sat in the room on the 23rd of February, heard these wonderful things from the Cabinet at the time, they were going to change things and fetch in independent assessors, and none of it actually happened until it was re-challenged on the, on the 20th of June and the 23rd of, 21st of August. And this council shouldn't operate like that, in my opinion. Not throwing any guilt out there, not holding any responsible. I just thought it's time to fetch us in and say, how do we learn from it? How do we stop it happening? By understanding what exactly happened. Um, 
not at the moment, not really. I was going to say, what are the, what is the reason? You've answered that very well. So um, at this stage, I've not really got anything else to say, um, but happy to contribute to this discussion. Anything from an officer perspective at the start? Okay, open the floor to any questions, or I'm happy to start. Councillor Bain, did you want to jump in? Yeah, just uh, just where are we now? What's changed since the 21st of August? What's actually happened? Because I haven't heard very much. Uh, Chair, if I'll just take that. Obviously, from the um, <coughs> excuse me, um, from the uh, full council um, uh, meeting, there was a recommendation that there was a strategic review undertaken. So since that time, obviously, we've been working with the portfolio holder to develop the scope and to uh, itemise what that review will look like, how it will be undertaken, and to put in place the, um, the, the, the information required to move that forward. There, there is a cabinet report on the forward plan for um, the next cabinet, which is October the 26th, I believe. Um, and that the, the nature of that will be um, sort of reported to cabinet um, so that that review then can move forward. Uh, in the meantime, obviously, the other thing that was, was sort of recommended at full council was that there was a suspension of any um, further work and a withdrawal of the current um, stage three notices that have been served on leaseholders with regard to roofing works. Um, that has also been undertaken. Um, so th those, those stage three consultations have been withdrawn and there has been an agreement that um, there will be no further works involving leaseholders unless there is a sort of imperative relating to health and safety and or um, uh, a need to undertake an urgent um, works for, for repair reasons. Um, in terms of sort of in the background then again, um, we continue to sort of work around um, some of the issues that, that related to uh, obtaining legal advice. Um, so so in, in effect, we're moving forward towards that cabinet report and then the, uh, the review will sort of kickstart uh, at that point, what that once that's gone through cabinet and that scope has been approved. Thank you, Chair. Anything further from members before I jump in? Just you mentioned about the urgent works. How many, how many urgent works have been carried out since the since the August meeting? As it stands at the moment, we've got one block where we're having to do fire door replacements. That was already works that were being consulted on an e-train at the time. We've had no reported urgent works, but those would normally come just through that uh, repair reporting process through the uh, call centre. So at the moment, it's only fire door replacements that we're having to do because they've been identified through the fire risk assessments as needing renewals. Has there been any further communication with the leaseholders since that 21st of August meeting? Has there been any communication with them? The only communication we've sent out since that meeting is the suspension notices just to notify the people that we have suspended and also just clarifying that, you know, we will still continue to do urgent works and that the, the fact that we have suspended that won't delay those works or cause any further delays to people because I think there was some concern that withdrawing those notices now could result in us having to start that process again and delay works and have people, I suppose, in abeyance while they're waiting for work. So we've just sort of clarified that that's not the case. Sorry, but as you, as you know, people have been living with this for a very long time, and I do think it's important that proactive communication happens to keep people informed about what the intentions are going forwards, just to take some of the stress and uncertainty out of this. I think they've had quite enough of that. And can I request we stop using the tier one tribunal threat at the bottom of every email without fully quantifying what it means because it's scaring the hell out of some people in their late 80s. Chair, sure, if, if I could respond to that, I mean, and clearly you've, you've sort of raised that with us and, and um, you know, thank you for doing that. I guess that, you know, there, there is an issue about certain prescribed wording and certain wording that we do need to include in some form within letters. But, uh, you know, equally, we, we absolutely understand that there is a balance to be struck uh, between sort of giving people the information that's, that's required, 
using the prescribed wording, but also making sure that that is fully explained. Um, and I think you know we, we do uh, recognise there is further work to be done on that, and we have not yet got that balance right. Um, so you know, thank you for raising that with us, and we are looking to put in place you know um, some some sort of further resources and some s further attention to that um, to ensure that we are sort of striking that balance wherever we can. It's not necessarily possible for us to always take out all of the legalese. Um, and obviously there are things that we do have to refer to that our solicitors require us to do. Um, but clearly, you know, I think we, we would all um, recognise that, uh, you know, we haven't got necessarily got that balance right just at the moment. Um, but we will be looking to, uh, to, to sort of uh, improve on that prior to the next communication. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is my second term on Tamworth Borough Council. And what became very clear when I first started um, on the council was that communication with residents is very, very lacking. Um, the type of communication. Um, I mean, dare I say that, you know, we've got elderly and vulnerable residents who might look at that type of letter that we're talking about and be extremely distressed about them. Um, I know that we, we've talked about communications over and over again at different committees for different reasons, but we really have got to get this right. It's unfair to residents to send out communications that aren't clear and in simple English, if I can put it like that, not everybody understands all the, the speak that we speak. Um, and I just think it's fundamentally important that we don't get people running scared of these types of things. Thank you. Councillor Smith, did you want to come in there? Yeah, I was going to say, um, yeah, the, the letter w that went out um, could have been better, so I um, appreciate that. Um, all I'd say is um, I will try and get in contact with the leaseholders, you know, just 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 a just a verbal conversation or face to face if possible and just um reiterate um you know what it means um and uh, hopefully um stifle any fears that they may have because uh, i think that's important thank you councillor smith okay just from my own personal perspective um Obviously, I did ask the monitoring officer for a copy of the emails between officers and councillors um, during the period of 23rd of February and the um, 20th of June when it was identified as scrutiny. Not much had happened. One of the reasons I've not exactly shared those is a lot of it's quite confidential and can, obviously can't be released publicly, but I'll just give members a quick rundown of how I've read it. Obviously, um, corporate. Corporate scrutiny met January slash early February in 2023, where we put together these seven recommendations on the back of a working group that had been working three months. Um, it was cross party, independents were on there, Labour on there, Conservatives were on there. We'd come to a consensus of seven recommendations. On the 9th of February, Democratic Services emailed officers, including Mr. Barnes and Mr. Weston, saying that the seven recommendations are in, asking to go to scrutiny on the 23rd of February. On the 9th of February, uh, officers updated um, the director, Mr. Barnes, um, with what those meant and also what they felt it meant legally to this council. On the 14th of February, it was emailed to the portfolio holder, Alex Farrell, who then sent an email on the 21st of February, exactly a week later, asking why nothing had happened. So the original email was resent by Mr. Weston to Mr. Farrell. Uh, on the 23rd, obviously, Cabinet agreed six of the seven recommendations that corporate scrutiny took to Cabinet, so those motions were agreed. So, democratically, the Council was now instructed to carry out those six recommendations. On the 8th of March, uh, Mr Weston asked uh, Mr Farrell for his thoughts. Uh, Councillor Farrell answered on the 13th of March that surely we should be getting an independent assessor, that's what we've decided. On the 13th of March, the officers answered uh, Councillor Farrell, saying why now that was difficult. But Councillor Farrell then answered, I don't care, I want an independent assessor. Um, a cabinet report was produced. Um, obviously, that is confidential because of items that are in it. So, But the cabinet report was produced, but never, ever went to a cabinet meeting. Even though one of the six recommendations cabinet approved said the next cabinet meeting would see a report. 
Cabinet is still yet to see a report. We've had several Cabinet meetings since. Uh, da -da -da -da. On the 20th of March, um, Mr Weston, Mr Barrett and the Cabinet member Alex Farrell had a Teams meeting. I've requested notes from that Teams meeting, but I've had no notes. And on the 28th of March, uh, Councillor Farrell, former Councillor Farrell, sent again to the officers, uh, it was sent again the officers of the Cabinet report, but I've seen no emails, and apparently no emails exist, of where that Cabinet report vanished from there. So my question to actually Mr Barrett, Mr Barnes, and Councillor Smith, who wants to jump in, what happened? How did we lose that track of that? How did we not enact what Cabinet had asked to do? I, I just want to understand it. I can start, I actually have no recollection of that Teams meeting. Sorry, did I say Mr Barrett? Uh, yes. Mr Weston, Mr Barnes and Alex Farrell, did I say Mr Barrett? Yes, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I thought sorry, it was me. So I, I, I can't comment on, on the outcome of that, but I am aware that um, that sort of, I think, information requested from um, portfolio holder to officers wasn't forthcoming at that time. It's very difficult to have a clear direction if we haven't got that level of detail. So, and that's, you know, that's not pointing the finger at anyone that's just uh, following the process that uh, any sound decision making goes. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so my question is probably more political, so I'll say aim it at the two gentlemen at the end who tragically are not at fault for this, but they seem to be able to answer for it. With short of me moving a recommendation to Cabinet for a change of process, how can we be assured that in future when scrutiny recommendations go to Cabinet and Cabinet approve the majority of them, they don't just vanish in the ether? I asked Councillor Jane, your absence Councillor Turner, at the last full council, does the controlling group take scrutiny seriously? Would you agree with me right now, a demonstration of what I'm showing here doesn't show a controlling group taking scrutiny very seriously? Councillor Turner, sorry. If I can, um, you, you've asked about lessons learned. Um, we've now implemented for every committee an action log that comes through the corporate management team. So we're actually aware of every recommendation that comes from, whether it be a scrutiny, whether it be a full council, whether it be a, a cabinet meeting, and they are effectively, that's the check sheet. So there is now a formal record of every action that we, that we have. Um, and so it's very, very easy to see where they sit and where they go. So, um, as a, if you like, as, as a management team for the council, we are absolutely making sure we take ownership of it. So, uh, you know, one would hope that there should never be, you know, a repeat of any lack of information passing between parties. If, if that's helpful for that, but I'll pass over to the leader now. That's done. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Cook. Um, yeah, you, you, you're right to say that. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're new, new to this uh, uh, this situation, and one of the first things we have done is already acted exactly what you've said. We've looked at the procedures, we've looked at the policies, we've looked at the practice, we've looked at the people, and that's why Councillor Smith was very much on board with everything that's here, and we have took a strategic review. We don't rush into it. We don't make knee-jerk reactions or judgments. We find if there has been areas of concern or weakness we're addressing that right now there i don't think there's any more need or requirement at the moment to change anything yes you can talk to us after outside this meeting and we'll explain in further detail what we've done how we do it why we're doing it but it is transparent it's open it's to the point now where everything is factual and that's the idea of giving us some time for a six month strategic review of it all uh, it's, it's right and proper to do that. It's not throwing it into the long grass. It takes time to look at it all, root and branch, and get it right. Because the people of Tamworth deserve that, and we will do that. Yeah, so <clears throat> I suppose the way I look at this is, um, so, and to, just to sort of um, put the picture across for those that might not have the full information at the moment is, is so we had the we had the, the cabinet meeting was at the end of February, um, and they were the recommendations from the working group prior to that. Um, now there was three, I believe, cabinet meetings um, subsequent after that, um, and before that I was put into position. Um, then there was another cabinet position. I suppose at that point, I 
wouldn't have known anything about it. I mean, it was, certainly wasn't on the agenda of, I think, the early June cabinet meeting. Um, and then the first, I suppose, I was made aware of um, the extent of those recommendations, certainly from those that would come from the cabinet rather than the working group, was obviously the corporate scrutiny meeting in June. Um, which is obviously where it was raised. So all I say is, um, well, one thing I, I was also going to say was I want to be very, very careful not to sort of diss my colleague because at the end of the he day, he's not here to defend himself. So, you know, I'm sure he's got um, uh, things that he would want to say. Um, but, um, you know, moving on from the June uh, corporate scrutiny meeting, you know, I've worked day and night, as, as I've alluded to, uh, at full council in August to um you know to 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 review all the information as i've said uh, obviously you know i'm not happy with what has produced in its entirety which is obviously why we got the strategic review now um so yeah that that's kind of my my feelings on it hopefully that sort of shows that i'm trying to be as transparent as possible in terms of moving on and actually learning from it well i suppose you'd look at it and go i, I don't ask me what the governance of this is but um you know, at the end of the day, you've got a situation where you've got the portfolio holder and you've got the officers. And I suppose, well, who is the motivating force then to sort of be a bit of a reminder to this situation? Who is who is directly responsible? So if there's anything, I mean, all I'd say now, like like uh, Councillor Turner has alluded to, um, is obviously, you know, if they... I would feel confident being being where we are now and the fact that I feel I'm on it, you know, these sorts of things wouldn't happen again. So you could, I could just say to you, well, don't fear not, you know, this will never happen again, certainly uh, while I'm in the position that I'm in. But, um, you know, I suppose if there's going to be any sort of structural change, it needs to be defined as to who is the driving force as being that sort of reminder as such, you know, is that democratic services? Is that whoever's, you know, reviewing the minutes, you know, that ne that sort of needs to be ascertained. Hope that helps. Thank you. I mean, from from my perspective, I mean, just just to back up what you said there, Councillor Smith, I'm aware uh, you first saw an email on the 15th of June, where it's updated the situation on the leaseholder roofs, where you were in agreement with the officer recommendations. I saw your face on the 20th of June. I think a lot of your opinions changed that night, didn't it? So yeah, absolutely. The timeline does colorate from what you just said there. Absolutely. Um, from a personal perspective, and obviously it's for a committee to decide. Um, I think everyone is aware, I've worked with Mr Barrett for a long, long time, and I trust him like I trust my own father. If Mr Barrett is telling me we've now put a process in place that captures this, I'm willing to let the matter drop. But obviously it's for committees to confirm that we're comfortable to say that piece of history has moved on, the leaseholders are getting the review they required, let's let that process take its course, but obviously open the floor to that. Councillor Claymore. Quick question on that. Um, who takes responsibility for the action plan? The, the action plans uh, produced by uh, Democratic Services on sort of on very soon after the meeting closes or the following day, that then comes to the executive management team, which is myself, Rob, uh, Anita Goodwin, and uh, and Joe. Um, we will then allocate sort of responsibility from there to whichever is the relevant officer. It then becomes between the responsible officer and the portfolio holder to discuss and take that action forward. Um, clearly, we, we're only responsible for providing the relevant information and the relevant um, sort of, if you like, technical expertise. It's, it's for the, the portfolio holder and ultimately the cabinet to make the decisions um, how it's taken forward. But with that approach, there is a logical um, way forward with everything. It means that we don't miss things from, um, you know, either not being in the minutes or uh, being in the minutes and, and, and not picked up, or indeed, you know, and anything else. So I think it's a logical way of squaring the circle that we seem to, you know, we, we seem to um, have, have got ourselves into with this. Um, it doesn't require any <coughs> constitutional change. Um, I just think it's good practice it's to, to do. It's yeah, yeah, um, you know, and it's, it's just making sure that the, the relevant items are picked up. Formally, which you know is uh, clearly an improvement uh, to, to my mind. Anyway, yes, I mean. Thank you, Chair. Um, for people to have trust in a process, for people to believe that what the process does 
is what's actually happening. There has to be very strong governance arrangements to support accountability and transparency. Those things have to be there. They also have to be predictable as well as transparent and, and open. Would I, as a member of the public, with these decisions having not been tracked through, would I have trust and confidence in that process? Would I? And I have to say the answer at the moment would be no, I wouldn't. So I think we need to be clear with the people who vote us into office that we have taken action to ensure the governance arrangements are robust and transparent. <coughs> You've given us an initial assurance, which I, I'm, I'm willing to accept, but I think we need more. We need to be absolutely clear that any decision that either the Cabinet or any other committee takes are tracked through using sound governance processes and cannot be lost in the system. I think if we do not arrive at that point, then we have a challenge. And, and I'll accept it for this time, Chair, but if I find us back here in a few months' time, then I will be challenging very hard about the governance arrangements and how strong they are and what actions we've taken to make sure that this sort of thing can't happen again. I'm sorry to be as blunt as that, Chair, but I, I think I needed to be. I also, in terms of communication, I did want to, while I've got the microphone, in terms of communication with members of the public, there is good guidance about how you communicate with the public in the accessible information standards. And I would actually like to see some of those standards applied in the communications with leaseholders and others, because they are very clear. We have to make communication available to those who find it most difficult, because if we can make it available to those who find it most difficult, it's available to everybody. So I'd like to see us do a lot more around communication. I agree with your point entirely about communication. Um, it's critical, and there is guidance out there. So I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to say, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll accept it for today, but we will be keeping a very close eye on this, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bain. You sound, you sound exactly like I did a couple of days ago. I've had time to calm down. Um, I think you're absolutely right in what you're saying. And yeah, it, it is time. Draw a line here. Let's move forward. We've, we've got a direction for the leaseholders. Um, it, it's a line we've used for a long, long time, Mr Barrett. We're, we're a learning council, aren't we? Um, yeah, let, let's learn. Let's move forward. So unless anybody else has got anything else they want to raise, I'm happy to close that item there. Oh, sorry, Councillor Coates. Yeah, like you say, a learning curve and everything. Um, before we close the item and move on, and that with the leaseholders, has the council ever thought of just sending a letter, just saying, sorry, how long it's took? You know, we've learned from it. Like you say, you put processes in place, put a letter explaining what you've learned from this to the 44 leaseholders, because I'm not being funny, that letter would mean a lot to them. Thank you. I think that is an item I raised at council on the 21st, and... I think the complication is who would write it, uh, because obviously the cabinet member responsible is no longer here. Um, I was leader when it started, but I wasn't leader when it kicked off. Uh, Jeremy was the leader when it really kicked off, but he's no longer leader. Paul wasn't involved, so would Paul write it? Uh, poor Councillor Smith wasn't the cabinet member at the time, but the cabinet member at the time is no longer a councillor. It just gets complicated who would write it, I think, sometimes. But I welcome a comment from Mr Barrett or Councillor Turner on that. <laughs> Yes, I, um, I'd like to pick, pick up on that. It's great writing a letter to somebody now, but we're only halfway through the process at best. So I, I would suggest, for the greatest respect through the chair, that we wait till we've finished. The new procedures with the chief exec and his team are, I would say, really watertight now. You know, we are scrutinising it. And once we've gone through this process, I mean, I know that my colleague, uh, Councillor Smith, is having not just written conversations, but face-to-face -face conversations with the said leaseholders, which is far better than a piece of paper because you get to intimate, understand and feel where they're coming from. And what we've done in the last three months, all of us as a team, and it's great to see that it's at scrutiny, where scrutiny should be looking at stuff like this, and we should be thinking about what can we do better, lessons learned. I think we are in a very good place now, and I'm confident that we will sort this out with speed but efficiency. And I'm confident that we can then talk to the leaseholders with a conclusion very shortly. Thank you for that. But the letters they get don't come from a councillor. You know, I've seen the letters. They come from 
you know, a, a, someone that works for the council. That's who I want it to come from, not a councillor, not that, actually someone from the council, because that's where you send the, the section 20 letters or whatever they, they come from. The council, I want an, an apology from them, the person that's been sending these letters for the past four years. Thank you. Uh, can I suggest the portfolio holder and yourself have a conversation yeah. outside the meeting and see if there's some way we can come to some sort of resolution on that? Yeah. And just for Councillor Turner's benefit, absolutely, as both myself and Councillor Bain have said, fair to draw the line, but we are watching, and that, as you correctly say, is the job of Scrooge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any further <coughs> questions or comments on this item? Then I can consider that matter closed and we move forward. Thank you. If there's any officers or any Cabinet members wish to leave at this point, feel free. We're just going to do a bit of committee business from this point onwards. Uh, we'll talk about you behind your back a little bit, etc., etc. <laughs>
Maycock is passionate about this. Uh, if we start with damp, because obviously winter is coming, so she, I'll get some information circulated on council's policies around damp before then. Should we kick off there? Because we've got to start somewhere. Yeah? Excellent. I think we've all sorted that. Can we just, um, while we're here, the, the next holder working group, are we just closing that yeah. now? It's, what, we've also got, there was a QPR one. Uh, yeah, close that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, is there any other requested working groups while we're here or anything? Yeah, just very quickly, there's been a recent, a recent housing ombudsman case about mould and damp and the failures of action to, the failures of councils to take action. I think we need to look at that. Okay, I'll take us to item 10, forward plan. Obviously, the forward plan has been circulated. Are there any items on there that spring to mind that somebody wants to fetch forward as a possible item for this scrutiny? I think we're kind of merging item 10 and 11, so we're kind of going into one at the moment. So, basically, we have got some things on the work plan we haven't covered yet. So, we've done council... Sorry, just bear with me. We've done council tax reduction. Obviously, um... We've got joint waste contract update. Uh, do we want to fetch the officers in from the joint waste service with Litchfield to, to look at how the service is performing? Is there a wish to do so? I'm looking at Councillor Doyle as a long-term portfolio owner. Uh, have you already got that on your scrutiny? Yeah, it's Scroll, it across that off. the contract, but if you're happy with it, guys. Uh, sorry, I think the complication is we're supposed to look at the actual physical contract. You're supposed to look at the operation. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. Uh, Staffordshire Leaders Board. Uh, obviously, uh, it's a meeting of leaders and chief executives at Staffordshire. Is there a wish to look at it? Because it was an item that was recommended last year and they never got around to. No idea. Fair enough. Dump that one. Uh, the Corporation Street project, that can go. Yeah. We already know what's happened there. Uh, the draft improvement plan for uh, regulation of council and social housing. It's something we looked at last year, which is the new regulations that are coming through around governing social housing and certainly council housing. Uh, we haven't looked at it for a while, so on our next meeting, should we call the officers forward to say how they're implementing the new regulations about the process of regulating and updating on social housing? Is that a wish for members? Yeah. Next meeting, please. Yeah, it was a bit weak last time, wasn't it? Yeah. I'll, I'll have a word with Mrs. Mustafa. I'm sure we can bury you in paperwork, Councillor Price. Um, I would prefer that to go paperwork. Is that the more? And are we due a quarterly performance report? At so the that's coming at the next meeting. Yep. Yeah. So our next meeting would be uh, looking at um, the draft improvement plan for the regulation of social housing and the quarterly performance plan of the council. Now that's two big meaty items. Would that be enough for the next meeting, or does anybody want to throw anything else out there? Yeah. I think that's a that's a meaty meeting if we do it right, isn't it? Chair, can I just check? Um, so we've got um, the social housing residency programme going to Cabinet on the 26th of October. Yeah, we're happy to have it after. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. So it's yeah. a statement of fact because it's yeah. answering it's legislation. Just, yeah, it's, so. you know, if, if we've got any recommendations on it, we can still soon yeah. send them back to Cabinet. No, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Anything anybody else particularly wants to look at the next meeting or further into the year just at this moment? Okay, I'll take us to the next item. Is there another item? No, I think we kind of encompassed it all, all in one minute. So, so we've squeezed all we've it all in, have yeah. Okay, at that point, I'm happy to close the meeting and thank councillors for their attendance. Thank you very much.